So my name is Tabitha Enoch. <clears throat> I use she, her pronouns. I'm one of the associate deans of students here at the University of Virginia with specific focus and orientation and new student programs. I hope um, some of you on the call um, may have met me during orientation. If you've attended orientation, if you have not attended orientation, I look forward to meeting you. I know there's more people continuing to join this call. Um, we have started a program called Wednesday Webinars. And one of the things that we learned during COVID is that we can certainly offer some content offer some level of engagement with the incoming class um, on Zoom so that you can be anywhere in the world and still get some of, this, some of this important information. One of the questions that I get often in orientation is, what about fraternity and sorority life? What about Greek life? What is that? How can we do it? What does it mean? When does it start? And so we thought, listen, let's do a webinar on that. And so we have some, I have my wonderful colleagues here. They're going to introduce themselves to you, talk to you a little bit about um, the process, the life here of uh, fraternity and sorority life on grounds, and then open it up for questions and answers. Um, so thank you so much for joining us on this wonderful Wednesday. I will turn it over to Alex, right, Alex? Yeah, yeah, you got Good. it. Thank you. Thanks, Tab. Hi, all. Uh, I'm Alex Winkowski. I use they, them, and theirs pronouns, and I am uh, the assistant director for fraternity and sorority life at UVA. Um, I do appreciate all of y'all being on the call this evening. I know it's very, very hot here, so I'm very grateful to be indoors tonight. Um, so I have um, a little bit of a plan tonight that I'm gonna go through in a second, um, but really I want this to be kind of a primer on fraternity and sorority life at UVA, hopefully give you all some good information about, you know, how to get involved, you know, what is it about? What is a fraternity? What is a sorority? I've gotten asked that question quite a few times over the past few weeks. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have answers to a lot of those questions. But before I do that, let me make sure I introduce you to our uh, fraternity and sorority life team. So at UVA right now um, in our office, which is located in Newcomb Hall, um, you, if you've been in orientation, we've had open houses and right there on the first floor and you might've stopped by and said hi to us. So um, uh, Dr. Dorothea Mack is an assistant dean of students and director of fraternity and sorority life. Um, and uh, she primarily advises our National Panhellenic Council and our Multicultural Greek Council. I'll talk more about our four councils here in a second. And we also have some students here from a couple of our councils who are gonna talk about their experience and a little more about uh, their governing councils as well. And then again, I'm Alex, um, I use they, them pronouns, and I am the Assistant Director for Fraternity and Sorority Life. And I work quite a bit with our Inner Sorority Council and Inner Fraternity Council. And I've been at UVA for um, a little over three years now. So first we're gonna start off with just like an overview of the fraternity and sorority community at UVA. And then I'm gonna give a chance for some folks from our community to talk about their own experience. So uh, we have someone from the Interfraternity Council and the Inter Sorority Council here on the call tonight. Unfortunately, representatives from the Multicultural Greek Council and National Panhellenic Council could not be here this evening, um, but um, we'll be covering a lot of information about how to join those organizations and become a part of those councils. And then lastly, we'll have some frequently asked questions at the end and then also a Q&A. Um, and so you're welcome to put questions in the question and answer box down at the bottom, um, and I can get to those throughout the, throughout the workshop and then also at the end as well. So before I talk about our office and specifically UVA, I want to talk about benefits of membership in a fraternity or sorority as a whole. So first of all, really what distinguishes and what really makes fraternities and sororities very unique is their values-based kind of um, orientation. So there are values-based organizations that focus a lot on scholarship, leadership, service, and brotherhood and sisterhood. Um, so while every single organization at UVA with fraternity and sorority life has different values that they focus in on, you will kind of hear themes around scholarship and service and leadership um, and brotherhood and sisterhood and honor and, and things like that. And what also makes fraternities and sororities very unique is that very often, um, student leaders in these organizations will be working with multiple stakeholders. So not just working with their peers, but also working with um, our office, working with headquarters officials, folks from their national headquarters, um, people who work with their house and their housing corporation, maybe working with alumni and faculty and staff. So really, when you talk about leadership opportunities, there really are a lot of ways that fraternities and sororities do kind of distinguish themselves and how many different stakeholders students might get the opportunity to work with. 
Next is lifelong friendships. So I am a member of Sigma Phi Epsilon. I joined at William & Mary uh, back in 2015. And a lot of my closest friends who I consider to be those kind of friends that you can always reach out to if you need anything are still remain my friends to this day. Um, in fact, one of my friends just reached out to me and said that he's gonna be back in the area recently. And so we're gonna get connected. And so for a lot of folks, and I'm sure that um, our student leaders who are on the call today can also speak to this as well, that these friendships that are made in these organizations are really ones that last for a very long time. Um, and you also get a lot of kind of career connections and networks during that time build. I mentioned service a little bit earlier, uh, but I'll talk a little bit about this more later. But what really is really amazing about fraternities and sororities at UVA is that not only are there national philanthropies and causes that the fraternities and sororities work with, there also are local Charlottesville organizations that a lot of the fraternities and sororities are committed to. And every single semester when I look through and I see all the different time and also funds donated to local Charlottesville organizations, it really is very heartwarming to see the fact that a lot of the fraternities and sororities at UVA are very committed to not only promoting their national philanthropies, but also supporting local organizations. And like I mentioned a little bit earlier, leadership opportunities are very unique and fraternity and sorority life at UVA is very unique and something you've probably heard many, many times if you've been in orientation or not, is that UVA's model of student self-governance really means that students have the opportunity to guide their own experience and to really take ownership of their roles and responsibilities. And this is no different in fraternity and sorority life. Like I mentioned earlier, these students are often working with stakeholders um, like alumni, faculty, staff, students, housing corporations, headquarters, our office, and navigating all of that is a great way to build a leadership portfolio as you're looking to, you know, to graduate, which is the ultimate goal of being at UVA. I also wanted to include a recent uh, Gallup poll and Gallup survey that was done back in 2021 about some outcomes of joining fraternity or sorority. So there has been, as a result of the survey, they found that affiliated alumni were more likely to report feeling supported by faculty and mentors, and three times as likely to have engaged in experiential learning, which means applying what they've learned in the classroom to an actual real life experience. And more than 50% of fraternity and sorority alumni had accepted a job offer or found employment within two months of graduation, as compared to just 36% of non-affiliated alumni, which is, you know, that's always really enticing to get that job. And then 24% of affiliated alumni strongly agreed that they had a job or internship that allowed them to apply classroom learnings, worked in a project that took more than a semester to complete, and were extremely active in extracurricular activities or organizations. And that was opposed as to just 8% of non-affiliated alumni. So there's just a few findings from that alumni survey that was done just last year that really show the tangible benefits of joining fraternity or sorority. These increased connections, increased um, you know, job acceptance rate, and also you know, feeling like there's a kind of a stronger connection to learning and, and extracurricular activities. So. So specifically fraternity and sorority life at UVA in our, in our mission, our office was founded in 2001 and our, our office is really here to support students in these chapters in these organizations as you know, they shape these principles like I talked about earlier, scholarship, leadership, service, diversity, and honor. Um, so at UVA, I'll talk about this more in a second, we have 60 organizations and we have four councils. So our organizations are individual chapters, individual organizations. Our councils are the four governing bodies that oversee different parts of or different uh, kind of subsets of those 60 organizations. And then our office advises and works with not just the councils, but also individual organizations as well. So it's really our role to strengthen student self-governance and to support students as they carry out the business of their chapters and their organizations and support them and make sure that they have what they need to run successful organizations and to really be the best organization that they can. And I mentioned earlier alumni and chapter headquarters staff. We also do work quite a bit with alumni and with chapter headquarters staff. Um, so for those who are unfamiliar with this, um, almost all of our organizations at UVA, all 60 of them almost, have a national or local headquarters. And so this is where their headquarters 
um, you know, is based and this is, you know, their, their national organization that dictates different policies and kind of connects them to the broader network of their fraternity around the country or even internationally in some cases. So our chapter, our, our office really works a lot with chapter headquarters staff to make sure that we're coordinating with them. And so they're not only getting support from our office, but also getting support coordinated from their headquarters office as well. So very often there's support coming from multiple different places. And it's our job as an office to make sure that we're kind of balancing that support and getting support to the students where it's needed. A little bit more about the UVA fraternity and sorority community. So 28% of undergraduates are part of the fraternity and sorority life community. Um, that's about 4,800 students. Uh, it's a pretty sizable portion. Um, when I was at William & Mary, um, it was also almost, almost about 30% as well. Um, it's a pretty sizable portion. The spring average for GPA in spring 21, which is the the uh, most recent data that we have that the spring 22 data has not been posted yet. Um, the community GPA was a 3.75 and the all undergraduate GPA was a, was a 3.6. Um, this is pretty common that the overall uh, community GPA in the fraternity and sorority life community is higher than the all undergraduate average. And this is a pretty common occurrence and it's happened um, ever since I've worked in the office and I believe for many, many years before that as well. Um, as I mentioned, philanthropic efforts and charity earlier. So um, in spring 2022, there were over 17,000, almost 18,000 service hours. And there were there was over $260,000 donated to charitable causes. And as I said, a lot of this is donated to local Charlottesville organizations in addition to national philanthropies and headquarters. So there are really big impacts being made on really important causes. Um, from heart disease to um, breast cancer to working with um, houseless kids and children, um, supporting local community organizations. And so this is a really great way to make an impact. And I know a lot of the folks um, who are in fraternities and sororities really enjoy this part of their work is giving back to local organizations and supporting their national philanthropies. The last thing I wanna point out about our community is that we have what's called deferred recruitment. Um, I see someone asked a question about um, you know, rushing and pledging and what those things mean and what the difference is between those. Um, so when we talk about rushing or going through recruitment, um, that happens in the spring here. So deferred recruitment means that new students in the university, um, unless they are transfer students, um, have to spend at least one semester here in the fall before they join a fraternity or sorority organization in the spring. So in the fall, this really gives new students time to get adjusted, to kind of settle in, figure out what they want to get involved with. And then when it comes to the spring semester, that's when um, the different councils and different organizations will kind of have their more formal recruitment processes. Um, and so we'll talk more in detail about the different recruitment processes and intake processes in a second here. Um, but I just wanted to point that out to make sure that was clear that joining these organizations would happen in the spring for new students. Um, there are some um, eligibility for some transfer students in their first semester, but for um, new first year students, um, recruitment happens in the spring. Um, I also want to take a second just to point out quickly some questions and um, some um, points about safety and wellness. Sa student safety and wellness at UVA is the highest priority. And because of that, we have an agreement with each of the 60 organizations to complete four programs every academic year that focuses on alcohol and drugs, hazing awareness, sexual respect education, and inclusion and respect education. Um, and we work with multiple campus partners in order to to address these different concerns and these different topics to make sure that students are all getting education on these issues. So we work with partners like Student Health and Wellness, the Women's Center, the Gordy Center, um, Multicultural Student Services, um, University Police Department, and the Equal Opportunity and Civil Rights Office to make sure that students are getting, you know, that folks are getting information that they need to be knowledgeable in these different areas. And this is something that's required every single year by all of our organizations who are under our office. And so I mentioned earlier that we have four councils and 60 chapters. So more specifically, our four councils that we have, our two largest councils are our inner fraternity council and inner sorority councils. There are 30 chapters under the um, 
Interfraternity Council, and there are 15 chapters under the Interstory Council. And we have a couple of representatives um, from one from each of those councils on the call today who's going to talk a little bit more about their experience. And then we also have Multicultural Greek Council and the National Panhellenic Council. Now, the Multicultural Greek Council and National Panhellenic Council, we have seven organizations in each of those councils. Um, the Multicultural Greek Council really focuses in on um, highlighting specific cultural experiences like uh, we have a Latina and Latino fraternity and sorority. We have um, an Asian or Asian interest fraternity and sorority. And we also have an all gender fraternity that's open to folks of all genders. Um, and that's one of our organizations that is actually a UVA founded chapter um, that does is not actually not connected to a national headquarters, but like kind of, you know, sustains itself as a all gender inclusive fraternity. And that's one of the organizations that I advise as well. And the National Panhellenic Council are historically Black organizations that I'll talk more about later as well. Um, these are organizations that have a deep history in college and universities creating space for Black students um, when, when councils and organizations prior to the National Panhellenic Council's founding, Black students were not allowed to be a part of. Um, and so this is a really deeply rooted history um, with Black college student community. And we'll talk more about that in a second as well, because these recruitment processes and intake processes look different. So if you're coming on the call and you're like, I want to join one of these organizations, but I don't really understand, you know, how to do that. I'm really glad that you're here and you can have this information because it's, it's very, they're very distinct processes for each of these councils if you're looking to get involved. So now I'll pass it over to Kayvon to introduce himself and talk a little bit about the Interfraternity Council. Hey everybody, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be here. My name is Kayvon Samadani, uh, you see him pronouns, and I'm a rising fourth year in the college and the president of the Interfraternity Council. Um, our Interfraternity Council here at UVA was established in 1934, and like Alex mentioned, we have 30 affiliated fraternities, and many of which are in the National Interfraternity Conference, or NIC. Uh, we have a governing board, which I'm the head of, with nine executive members and two at-large members made up of the presidents of our, uh, of our council. And I can just say from my own personal experience, everything that Alex touched on in the beginning of the benefits of Greek life is absolutely true. I've made uh, the best friends of my life here at the University of Virginia in my fraternity. I know exactly who are my groomsmen are going to be at my wedding. You know, these are the guys who have supported me as I've transitioned into becoming, you know, an adult, and they've supported me, pushed me, pushed me to lead. Uh, in fact, what Alex was saying about leadership on grounds is very true. Uh, Greek life here at UVA has a, a pretty strong emphasis on leadership, on stepping up, on buying into that culture of student self-governance in a way that I don't really think many other organizations do. And so joining is an incredibly unique opportunity to make a positive difference in the lives of people around you. You know, from the very moment, I, I mean, really, when I started pledging, I was told, all right, guys, we need somebody to organize two uh, study halls every week for, you know, the pledges. Who's going to do it? You know, I'd step up and lead. You know, we need somebody to be the flanky chairman. Who's going to do it? Step up and lead and, and so on and so forth. And you really get an opportunity to make positive change in people's lives. That's, that's very unique, um, I think, in, in on grounds. Now, let me just touch on the recruitment process. So like Alex touched on, we recruit in the spring semester, which is really great. You don't feel like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing here. I got to try to join an organization. That's not at all what we want. We want you to know this is something I think might be for me. I want to check it out. And so what you'll do is you will spend about two weeks going through what's called Rush. And it's different events. You'll sign up, you'll register, and each fraternity will host different events and you'll get invites. And as you go through the process, there are open house rounds, which is everybody, you can go to any house and I certainly encourage you to do that. Then the rounds get more and more uh, exclusive as they go on until eventually you're left with maybe three, two, you know, one fraternity at the very end. And then you'll go and, and indicate to them, hey, you're my first choice. If you give me a bid, I accept. And then the next day is bid day. And that was one of the happiest moments of my first year, uh, I can say, and I can probably speak for many other young men here at the University of Virginia and saying that that was a, a pivotal moment. Uh, in their college career. And registration opens in November. Um, it's open for a while. You have plenty of time. Um, I recommend just registering to do it because uh, you, I mean, there's a, there's a small registration fee, but if you can't afford that, we cover it. So cost is not so much of an object there. 
but I always recommend people do it because even if you don't join at the end, you still get to do really cool things with really cool people, meet people in your class, older people, make these connections. Um, and it's a really fun time. Fun is definitely the word I would use uh, to categorize uh, Fraternity Rush. Awesome. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Kayvon. So um, uh, we did get a question. I hope maybe you can help to answer this. So um, can you talk about kind of what the difference is between rushing and pledging? Yeah, certainly. So when you rush, you are pretty much free to go to whatever organizations uh, are hosting events. It's mostly about you as an individual getting to know this chapter, what their values are, who's in there, you know, what what their 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 lives are like being brothers of the organization you'll go to different events that's a two-week process and then at the end of that you'll most likely get extended a bid to join uh, an organization if you accept that you'll then become a pledge and now each chapter will have a different um you know internal process that they'll go through it could last uh you know it, it could be just a, an instant sort of brotherhood and then you go through a different sort of process or it could be all semester and basically what it is is about educating you on the history of the fraternity, the, the brotherhood, the history of the local chapter, bonding you as a pledge class to ultimately be ready to go through whatever sort of ritual or initiation process there is at the end of pledging. So that's kind of a high level difference. It's hard to get into specifics because each organization does have a different process, um, but I, I hope that answered your question and I can definitely go into more specifics um, if, if Alex, you think I should. Um, so I'm happy to just add like a little bit to that. So I think that was a good overview. Um, the one thing that I'll add from the Fraternity Sorority Life Office is that we we do set a, a, a deadline or kind of a an end date for pledging for all organizations across the community. So usually around the end of March or so is where we say, okay, uh, you have to set up your pledging process so that folks are able to be initiated by you know I think last this past year was March 28th or something. So um, there has to be a a, a deadline for that so that you know folks are going into finals or the end of the semester still not being initiated members of that organization so our office does set initiation deadline which is very common um, across the country with returning story life offices um, the only other thing that i'll add is that there are some organizations also that don't have a pledge process and have a very different new member process for example sigma phi epsilon the fraternity i'm a member of um, doesn't have a pledge process they actually the day you get your bid is the day you are initiated and you are a full voting member of that organization from the second that you accept your bid. So um, different organizations, different processes, just like Kayvon said, and some organizations also don't have a pledge process. And SIGEP has a, Sir Sigma Phi Epsilon has a kind of a more like you joined and now you kind of have a startup kind of process after you've already been initiated and have a different way of kind of bringing new members into the organization. It's a good question. Let me see. I got a couple other questions, and I th I think what we're going to do is that I'll hold on to those till we get to another second, the next section in the uh, PowerPoint because those are relevant in a little bit. So I'm going to pass it over to Grace to talk a little bit about the Inner Sorority Council. Yeah, thank you. Um, so my name is Grace Owens. I am the incoming Vice President of Recruitment for PNM Affairs for the Inner Sorority Council. Um, I'm a rising third year majoring in statistics. So um, I wanted to start by giving a little bit of an overview of the council. It was established in 1975, just five years after women were admitted into the university. Um, it is the governing body. Um, it has eight executive members as well as uh, 15 representatives, one for each chapter of the National Panhellenic Conference Affiliated Sororities. Um, and I guess a little bit about my experience in the sorority. Um, I guess very similar to Kayvon, I have met my lifelong friends. Um, I actually just got back from study abroad where I lived with three of my sorority sisters. Um, and also, um, as far as like leadership opportunities and this position, um, I've had a lot of leadership opportunities um, through the Inner Sorority Council, as well as my individual chapter before I was elected to this position, as well as involvement with the community um, through my position with the Inner Sorority Council. I've been able to work with the community um, and serve as a board member for the Venable City neighborhood, which has been a great opportunity. Um, so yeah. 
So I guess a little bit about the uh, recruitment process for the ISC. It's very different from the um, IFC recruitment process. It's very centralized and highly structured. Um, potential new members will register to participate. Um, it opens in September and it's open for several months. Um, so the events are very structured. We'll have the move-in date for potential new members be Friday, January 13th. And then the next day, Friday, January 14th will be the first round of recruitment. Um, that will be round robins and all PNMs will get to attend every chapter over two days, um, get to know the chapters a little bit in short rounds. And then um, through a mutual matching process, we'll go back to 11 houses, um, for the philanthropy round, which we had January the next day, January 17th, um, or actually, I'm sorry, January 16th will be MLK Day, and then January 17th we'll have the next round. Um, so it's over a two-weekend period, um, which gives uh, girls the opportunity not to have to move in early for recruitment, but also um, not be like in the middle of the semester and stressed about classes. So that's really great. Um, then the next weekend, we'll come back and we'll start the house tours round where girls will have the opportunity to attend up to six houses, um, see their houses, um, and have longer conversations to better get to know the chapter. Because every chapter, as Alex had touched on, has different, um, slightly different values and character and just where you feel the most comfortable. Um, after that, we'll have, I mean, preference round and during preference round, PNMs will attend two houses and kind of at this point you kind of know like oh um, I think like this would be the best fit for me and you get to know people that you've met through the recruitment process better um, it's a really fun day and then that night you'll submit your preferences and then the next day is the day. Awesome thanks Grace. Um, I got a question um, that someone asked uh, what percentage of girls who rush will eventually get chosen by a sorority? Um, that's a really, that's a, that's a complicated um, question to answer. So um, I've talked about this a lot when people come into the office over uh, during, uh, during the open houses over the past few weeks during orientation. Um, so um, really this process benefits those who go in and enter with their open mind. It really prioritizes those who come in and think, you know, I don't really know where I want to join, but I'm going to give each of these sororities a real, like, a real go at it and, like, see which one makes me feel most welcome and where I, where I feel like I can call home and where I can find my sisters. So this is, this process really benefits those who enter their open mind and are really, really open to joining any of the 15 organizations. Uh, because if by the end, um, like Grace had mentioned earlier, if during preference round, that final round where you are maybe visiting just one or two houses, if you on your, when you set your preferences at the end of that day, if you say, you know, I went to both these houses and I would be comfortable joining either of these organizations. If you put both those down on your sheet, you're guaranteed to get a bid from, a, from one of those organizations. And so if you can keep an open mind and be really open to being a part of, you know, of multiple sisterhoods and really keep that open headspace throughout the process. And by the end, you're like, you know what, both these organizations really seem like really good fits to me you're guaranteed to get a bid from one of those organizations and get an invitation to join, which is really awesome. So um, the question, what percent of girls who rush eventually get chosen by a sorority? You know, honestly, it could be 100%. If, if people really like kept their open perspective and really kept with the process and maximized the number of people, number of organizations at the end there, you're guaranteed to get a bid to one of those organizations. Um, you know, I, on average though, over 80%, well over 80% of folks who go start through the process will, will, uh, will join a fraternity or will join a sorority rather. So um, percentage wise, it's well over 80% who go through the process end up joining. I think it's even over 85% this past year. So it's a good question. Let me see, let me see what other questions we have. Um, okay, let me talk about that in a little bit. Um, and I'll go back to some of those other questions that I have waiting there in the queue. So let me, um, just show this quick little map here. This is a map of all of the uh, fraternity sorority houses that are recognized at UVA. 
Um, so you can kind of see the rotunda and the lawn over on the right side here. And you can see kind of, I get kind of asked like, where is like fraternity or sorority row? It's a complicated answer, complicated question because there is a, they're kind of, you know, all over the place kind of around Madison Bowl, across the street from the rotunda to across the Beta Bridge. And so I like to put this map up here just to give you an idea of just, you know, how visible a lot of these organizations are and the potential impact and like the visibility of these organizations and the impact they can have on the community. Um, but I also like to put this up here to show that this is only part of the story of fraternity and sorority life at UVA. I mentioned that the Inter Sorority Council and the Inter Fraternity Council are the two largest councils. Um, we also have two, um, two councils, the Multicultural Greek Council and National Panhellenic Council, that I'm gonna take a second to talk about. And while they don't have these large, you know, recognized houses, many of them do have houses together, live together, um, and they're really important parts of our community. So I wanna take a second to also highlight uh, those councils as well, even though representatives could not be here tonight. So first, the National Panhellenic Council was established in 1991 as the Black Fraternal Council. Um, it's a their governing body of seven, and it's referred to as the Divine Nine. UVA has eight um, of the Divine Nine organizations currently. Um, the Divine Nine refers to you know, the nine organizations within the National Panhellenic Council around the country. And again, like I mentioned, the National Panhellenic Council and these organizations were founded in response to creating space for Black collegians to be a part of fraternity and sorority at a time when uh, predominantly white or like only white fraternities and sororities were, um, were in existence. And this was carving out space for black students to be able to have that experience. And so there's a lot of history and tradition steeped in these organizations. And as you can imagine, the recruitment or what they call intake process for national panel and council organizations looks quite different from Interfraternity Council and Inter Sorority Council organizations. So the intake process is really, as opposed to the Interfraternity Council and Inter Sorority Council, it's very decentralized in the National Panhellenic Council. It's conducted individually by each organization. So while the Interfraternity Council and Inter Sorority Council recruitment processes are centralized and kind of conducted together with, between the organizations and overseen by the council. The intake process for these organizations is very decentralized. And so they're conducted individually by each organization to maintain confidentiality and preserve the individualized nature of the experience. And so these processes look very different for the different seven or eight organizations at UVA. And really the way to get involved with these organizations, there's not gonna be kind of a National Panhellenic Council intake registration process. It's really about getting to know individual chapters and so my best advice to you would be to check out individual chapter Instagram pages. Um, our website will be at the end and you can um, take that down and we have a list of all the organizations on our website. And you can attend their events in the fall. A lot of these, uh, there's gonna be a Meet the Greeks event for these National Panhellenic Council organizations in the fall. And you also can attend their events, follow them on Instagram. A lot of them will have interest meetings um, where you get to meet the members and kind of see, kind of see, um, you know, get to meet some folks and, and get to chat with people that way. And so that kind of tends to be the best way to get connected with these organizations. The Multicultural Greek Council was established in 1999 and oversees eight uh, cultural and identity-based fraternities and sororities. Some of the organizations are affiliated with headquarters um, and some are not. Like I mentioned earlier, our all-gender fraternity, which is Sigma Omicron Rho, doesn't have a headquarters or a national organization. They are a UVA-founded and UVA-based organization, and they don't report or have a um, national headquarters or international headquarters that they, that they report to. Um, but really, these organizations um, highlight specific identities and experiences and kind of create um, affinity and uh, connection spaces for uh, Latina, Latinx, uh, Latino, and uh, Asian, Asian interest fraternities and sororities. And some of the organizations in the Multicultural Greek Council um, call their recruitment process recruitment. Some of them call it intake. It kind of varies by the organization. Um, but they practice a decentralized new member selection process. And so similar to the National Panhellenic Council, the, the new member selection process is very individualized by the chapter and it's conducted individually by the organization. 
And again, similar to the National Panhellenic Council, you're gonna want to check out individual chapter Instagram pages, keep an eye out for their events, their interest meetings, and kind of just, you know, keep an eye out for, for what's going on to get connected with these organizations. Before I go into frequently asked questions, I wanna go back to our questions here and I want to answer some of those. So, um, let me see. And uh, Kayvon and Grace, I might need your help with some of these, just so you know, because I'm not, I'm not sure if I have the answer for some of these. So one of them is, is it common that some people still go to organization events, even if they aren't a part of the organization? This is something I can start us off with. Sure. Um, so uh, many of the interfraternity council uh, fraternities are social fraternities, and so they'll host, you know, parties, mixers, what have you. Um, so that to answer that question, many have or are, are were required to have lists for parties uh, for for safety. And so if you're a friend, you know, I invite plenty of my friends who are non Greek affiliated to social events that my fraternity has, and that's that's very common. Um, however, I will say if you don't know anybody in any, you know, IFC affiliated organizations, you're maybe not going to be able to go to all their social functions. Uh, it's better to get to know them um, first. But generally speaking, it, it's a pretty uh, like open social community. Um, so socially, you, you, you will be able to attend events, even if you're not Greek affiliated. Um, absolutely. Thanks. Um, oh yeah, Grace, do you have anything to add to that? No, uh, he pretty much touched on it. I would say like a lot of our philanthropy events are open to um, all members of the UVA community, so. Right, that, that's a good point. A lot of the philanthropy events and, and some of the social events and then also some of the, um, you know, some of the broader programs that the organization will do are open to all members of the UVA community because ultimately, um, the goal of Fraternity Story Life is also to give back to the broader community and not just kind of insulate itself. So I'd say that's a, that's a goal of um, all the councils. Well, the next question I have is, will dues happen during rush or pledging? Um, I, I'm trying to remember my, my own experience with that. Um, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, how uh, dues deadlines and things and happen, happen in some of the different chapters. I think they it probably depends on the organization. Um, if there are any dues that are, you know, required during um, during the pledge process, um, there's no there's no the only dues for rush are going to be the small registration fee, or um, I think it's about a twenty five dollar registration fee. And or came on, you can correct me. How much the registration fee? It's fifty dollars. It was fifty dollars last year. Fifty dollars last year. But and I will say and they will uh, cover it. You, the IFC will pay for it. Absolutely. No questions asked if you uh, request it. So that, yeah. Right. And so, yeah, a few years ago, the IFC started covering that regardless of, you know, without, with any questions asked. So if you need support for that, um, that is the only, that's the only due dur dues during rush is going to be the registration fee. Um, and if that is something that is cost prohibitive for you, you can absolutely, you know, apply to get that, um, you know, get that paid for. Um, so dues aren't actually due for the organization that you're joining until pledging or initiation happens. So those, that's when dues are usually due. Um, so there won't be dues during rush. Um, and I'll also have a note about financial transparency here in a second, and I can add more to that as well. Um, someone asked, what category does a medical sorority fit in? I've gotten this question a lot during um, during open houses. So someone asked me about a business fraternity, a uh, medical sorority. Um, and so to answer that question, fraternity and sorority life, um, we specifically focus on those four councils. And these are organizations that I think kind of, you know, casually would be called like social fraternities and sororities. Um, they have values related to scholarship and leadership and service. However, um, there's not like a specific, um, you know, subject or kind of like discipline affiliation with these organizations, like academically. So there are uh, business sororities and like business fraternities, medical sororities, so all of those as well that exist. A lot of those are housed though in, a, in specific schools or as um, student organizations or CIOs, if you are familiar with, with that term, contract independent organizations. So those are not um, fraternal organizations that we oversee, those are ones that are kind of outside of our office.
Um, and then someone asked, when you register for Rush, do you find out how many recruits they will be able to accept? Um, Cabo, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so there is no upper limit and there's no lower limit. Um, it's totally up to the chapter's discretion. Um, so I, I mean, I know of chapters who during an intake process recruited zero uh, members and I know chapters who've recruited 35. Um, it really depends on what that chapter is looking for. Um, and, and, you, and that's something you can ask when you go to these rush events. So, you know, how many people are you looking for in a pledge class? You know, those are very, uh, you know, important questions to ask. But again, there's no upper limit. There's no lower limit. Yeah. And for, for, um, for inner sorority council uh, recruitment, um, that, that kind of information isn't even like talked about until the end of recruitment. So like there is that there's a wide range of number of folks who can be accepted to each organization. Um, and so it really is not something that, you know, we could give an answer on before the recruitment process is over and the chapters have kind of found their, their pledge class or their new member class sizes. Um, and then the last question I have on here for now before we get into our frequently asked questions is, is it possible to get tapped for a chapter instead of going through the rush process? Kayvon, do you want to answer that? Yeah, so while some uh, members of the fraternity council do consider themselves secret societies, um, we're not like, you know, the secrets, like the Z's and, and M stuff um, like that. So it's that's a different process. Um, so I believe, I don't believe it's allowed to just give somebody a bid. I mean, I guess you could, but there'd be some weird hoops you'd have to jump through. So no, I mean, traditionally, all the new members will come from that formal uh, recruitment process in the interfraternity council. Right. And, you know, there's, and again, like there's no expectation that in the fall folks, you know, have to, you know, go to any fraternity events or anything in order to be, in order to be considered for membership in the spring. Again, no as well for the inner sorority council, there's no tapping before um, formal recruitment. No. Cool. Awesome. Okay, let's go through some frequently asked questions. Um, and hopefully some of those, some of these will, some of the questions are also related to what's already been asked as well. So first about cost. So um, I get asked this question quite a bit too, and it makes sense. Um, you know, these organizations, joining these organizations do cost, do cost money. And I've talked to a lot of parents about that as well. Um, so dues range from $15 um, in, in um, one of our organizations to up to $3,000 per semester, depending on the organization. Um, so you can tell it's a, it's a pretty wide range of, of cost. Something that I'll point out is that there are scholarships available from individual chapters at the council levels and at the headquarters level. Um, so you know, there are scholarships available in multiple different ways. The different, the chapters kind of manage their scholarships differently. Some organizations have one scholarship that covers the entirety of dues for um, a member for all three and a half years of membership. Others have, have a few smaller scholarships that they give out that cover dues. Um, there also are um, council scholarships through the different student governed councils at UVA. And there's also headquarters scholarships as well. So, um, there are multiple different ways to get financial support, um, but it is worth noting that these organizations, you know, do vary on their cost um, per semester. The last thing that I will definitely mention on here is that financial transparency is super important in all of our organizations and all of our councils. Um, even so, especially I'll just point out in the inner sorority council, for example, all the organizations are required during the second round of recruitment to take five minutes to talk about their dues and kind of go through how it breaks down. So, you know, they say their dues are this much money and this is how much goes to um, meal plan. This is how much goes to, um, to uh, parlor fees, you know, different, different ways that that like breaks down. And so it's just, it's really important in the community to be really open about how much things cost. And that's true in all the different organizations. So if let's say you're going through the IFC recruitment process, um, you should definitely feel comfortable to ask if it hasn't already been told to you, hey, how much do you use cost for this organization? Because that's an important key to knowing, is this going to be something, is this going to be an organization that's going to be, you know, it's going to work for me. And it's totally valid to want to know that information. And so all of these organizations um, are really encouraged. And for a lot of 
times are required to be very open and transparent about how much they cost. Do you all want to add anything about dues and uh, dues and accessibility or anything around that? Yeah, um, so I'll just say almost every um, IFC chapter has some sort of either local or national scholarship. Many have both. Um, and the IFC has a scholarship as well. And there was a question about, um, is there a scholarship requirement? Uh, for the IFC chap, uh, scholarship, there is. The, the scholarship is taken into consideration. And I believe that for many, there might be. Um, I can tell you in my chapter there is, but that really depends. Um, some might be entirely needs-based. Some might be based on holding a leadership position. You know, So there are many, many considerations, but, but GPA certainly it could be one of them uh, for many chapters. I would say it's the same for the inner sorority council. And for the uh, multicultural Greek council and the national pan Atlantic council, I know that for many of the national organizations, they do have really robust scholarships available. Um, and, you know, based on like the history of the organizations as well also have, um, you know, needs based scholarships available as well. Um, great. Okay, let's go to the next one, and we're going to get back to that, the next question that's in the chat there. Um, what about alcohol? Um, so I get asked this question quite a bit, you know, about alcohol use in the community um, and how big a part of alcohol, how big a part of the fraternity and sorority community is, you know, drinking and alcohol. So the first thing that I'll say is that there are many students in the fraternity and sorority life community who do not who do not drink at all or do not consider drinking to be a key component of their fraternity and sorority life experience. Um, and really the best way to get an accurate gauge on this is gonna be to ask the chapter president or a trusted executive member as you're going through the recruitment process or joining process and kind of ask them about the perspective on alcohol culture in the organization. Um, you know, I think, you know, I, I would be lying if I said that folks don't drink at UVA. I think that that's very clear. It is college, drinking alcohol on a college campus has been a thing for many, many decades since the beginning of colleges were a thing in the United States. So, you know, I think it's important that as you're going through the recruitment and joining process that you know kind of the culture of the organization that you're joining and also know that you're gonna be supported by our office and by the Office of Health Promotions and other campus partners around who are gonna be able to support you in making really informed decisions about alcohol use and things like that. Um, and then someone asked, is alcohol part of the recruitment process at all? So um, for the Interstate Council and the Interfraternity Council, rush and recruitment is, is a dry process. So there should not be alcohol present at any of the registered recruitment events for either the Interfraternity Council or Inter Sorority Council. I can also say that is the same for the Multicultural Greek Council and the National pan Atlantic Council as well. Do you all want to say anything else about that? Uh, just that, yeah, if you're, if you're a chapter and you're caught uh, violating the no alcohol policy, you'll get fined. Um, I mean, that's just that's cut and dry, plain and simple. Um, and and that, that tip that Alex mentioned about asking an executive, you know, what is the drinking culture here is super important. Um, and you'll also probably be able to gauge how social uh, fraternity is. And so I think, you know, are you having social events every weekend? Do those have alcohol? Like those are the kind of questions you want to ask. Um, and, and Alex is absolutely right. Like those are, those are really good questions to ask to gauge. Is this for me? Is this what I want to be a part of? It's the same for the inner sorority council. Um, drinking during recruitment is a heavy fine. So. Great. Okay. So like I mentioned again, our office is here to provide support and to provide education and work with other grounds partners to, um, to inform folks about not just you know safe drinking and making informed decisions about alcohol and drugs, but also to be knowledgeable about topics like sexual respect and hazing and inclusion and respect education as well and kind of diversity, equity and inclusion. So because of that, our office requires that at least 70% of chapter membership or attend a program on each of the following topics every single academic year. Um, one important 
exception that I'll note to that that is new starting on July 1st of this year is that every single potential new member, and if you've gone through orientation, you now have been through a hazing prevention workshop at this point led by the Gordy Center, um, which is a um, UVA-based um, organization that does education um, um, who was named after Gordy Bailey, who died of an alcohol overdose, um, alcohol-related, hazing-related overdose. Um, and so they do workshops on hazing prevention. Um, and so on July 1st, the um, Adams Law was passed, and Adams Law is named for Adams Oaks, who died in an alcohol overdose in a hazing-related incident at Virginia Commonwealth University, or VCU, um, just last year. And so this law requires that all potential new members, all current members, all um, advisors all be trained on hazing prevention efforts. And so this year we're gonna be working, our office is gonna be working with the Gordy Center and with other partners to get every single member of a fraternity or sorority or any organization that has a new member process across the university trained in hazing prevention. Um, so in particular, you know, we focus on these four topics because these are ones that are of particular relevance in fraternity and sorority life. Um, but in particular, hazing prevention this year um, is going to continue to be a really important priority for our, uh, for our office. Next is how do I report incidents? So as I mentioned earlier, you know, you, you can't, I, I can't sit here and say that, you know, there aren't, there aren't, there isn't drinking happening in these organizations or across UVA. That is, you know, that is something that has been existing on college campuses for many, many years. And so let me talk about how to report incidents. So our office and UVA as a whole has anonymous reporting mechanisms and then also, um, you know, not anonymous reporting mechanisms. So, you know, if, um, if folks have any reports about hazing, we have a hazing hotline and I highly recommend, and this will, this will come up when you go through any of the council recruitment processes, you'll get reminded about this hotline at the beginning during orientation or during your first session. Um, and it's really important that folks put it in their phone and kind of keep it available to them in case they need to report anything. Um, this is 100% anonymous. This is not something that you know is gonna be traceable unless you say your name on the call. Um, and then we also have address report it, which you all have probably also heard about if you've been through orientation. This is where you can report many, many different types of incidents or issues or just general concerns. Um, so just report at Virginia.edu. You can also report hazing incidents um, or other concerns there as well. Um, and that is not anonymous. And so just as it's important to be knowledgeable about these prevention efforts, it's also important for y'all to be knowledgeable about reporting mechanisms and how to be knowledgeable about how to report these different concerns. So with that, um, I'm going to, uh, one of the questions I also will get is, you know, what is advice for a new student looking to join one of these organizations? So I have some like general advice, um, but then I'm also going to um, let Kayvon and Grace also talk a little bit about their own, um, their own advice that they would give for folks who are looking to join a fraternity or sorority at UVA. So first is to consider all your options. So this means not only across chapters, but also across the councils. So I would really encourage you all to, you know, get a really good breadth of information about the entire fraternity and sorority community across the chapters, across the councils, attend philanthropy events, you know, attend interest meetings from multiple different organizations, um, you know, kind of just like, like move around the area around Rugby Row, kind of get a feel of like what it, what it feels like to be around these different organizations um, and consider all the options available. Um, you're going to hear stereotypes. That's like not really a spoiler. That's going to happen. Um, you're going to hear stereotypes about different organizations and just know from the very beginning that these stereotypes are not the whole story. Um, and so you might hear that XYZ chapter is only interested in this or their XYZ chapter is only interested in this type of person or this type of girl. XYZ chapter is the is like the quirky one, the smart one or whatever. You might hear things like that. And so just know that these are not the whole story and um, you definitely have to explore yourself and make your own informed decision um, and kind of look beyond those stereotypes. And then just know there's gonna be many options to get involved. So just like Kayvon mentioned earlier with the IFC and Grace mentioned with the ISC, like there's many different organizations to get involved with. And with the MGC and the NPHC, 
there are just, there's so many different organizations and so many different values and vibes and like groups of people that you could get to know. So just know that whatever organization that you want to join, just know that you kind of corny sounding, but like you should really just be true to who you are and, you know, go with, you know, go with really what feels most at home to you. Um, Grace, is there anything you want to add? Yeah, going along with the stereotypes, um, I think the best advice I could give was just to keep an open mind through the process. It's a really long, it's tiring. I know the days are very long, but to really try to get to know all the different chapters and not just listen to what you've heard from like your friends or your hallmates. Yeah, and then my advice to a new student considering Greek life would be uh, sign up for Rush. Um, it's, it's really uh, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, you make the, the rush feedback, I mean, within like two days, just because all the amount of fun activities you can do with a bunch of great people who want to get to know you and, and you get to know people who are older than you, people in your class, even if you're not sure you want to join yet. And then like Alex said, be who you are, be yourself, because there are 30 interfraternity council um, fraternities uh, on grounds. And, and I'm willing to bet that one of them fits your vibe. One of them fits your interest, whether you like video games, sports, you know, I mean, whatever it might be, like there's a fraternity for you and, and, and you won't know until you, until you go out and find it. Awesome. Thanks y'all. Um, so with that, um, we have, you know, I'm happy to be here for a few minutes for any questions that folks have. I have put um, I see I have one question in the chat that I'm going to go ahead and answer in a second here. Um, I've put the um, different Instagram accounts for the different councils on here. So at the top here, we have the UVA underscore FSL account. That's the fraternity and sorority life um, Instagram. And I also have the IFC Instagram, the ISC or inner sorority council Instagram, the multicultural Greek council Instagram, and the national panhellenic council um, Instagram. We have our website on here as well, where I said you can find a list of all the organizations, and then also our office is Newcomb Hall um, on the first floor. Um, one of the questions that's on here is, uh, what is the average time commitment for an organization? Um, that is a tough question to answer, but I can say overall that average time commitment is going to be kind of during your new member period is going to be a little bit more intense. So I would say, you know, during joining or pledging or just being a new member of an organization, that tends to be um, a little bit more time commitment than, than later on. Um, however, once you are a member of an organization, it really is going to be largely dependent on how much of a commitment you want to have to that organization. It's really going to be based on, do you want to be a leader in that organization? Um, do you want to take on a chair position or run a program or you know, be the vice president of recruitment. Because I can tell you things like being a vice president of recruitment or recruitment chair in an inner sorority council organization is going to have times of the year where it's pretty, you're going to be kind of like living and breathing your sorority for a little bit. And that's just kind of how it is. Um, whereas, you know, if you wanted to take on smaller roles or maybe not take on a leadership position, that would definitely minimize the time that you'd be committed to the organization. So um, after that new member period, really it's going to be dependent on how much you want to be involved. And I will, uh, one thing I will actually will add to that is that for some of our smaller organizations, so some of our National Panhellenic Council organizations, especially because they're smaller numbers of people in the organization, you're going to be taking on a pretty hefty leadership role just by the fact that the organization is smaller in numbers. Um, and so that will be an expectation that is, you know, communicated to you as you're going through the intake process. Well, I just want to say thank you so much to Alex, Kayvon, and Grace for answering all of the questions. It was a very active chat going on and you all did a great job answering the questions. Um, if you haven't had a chance to come to orientation, there's always an FSL open house on the second day of orientation. So I encourage you to pop in and say hello to the team on the first floor of Newcomb Hall. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And if you have any other questions, don't hesitate to reach out to any of us on the call. Y'all take it easy now. Good night.